and we're going to start with a little bit of scene setting uh, by by Daniel about um, an uh, IAB a Europe instance called the Industry Leadership Council, uh, which launched about a little over a year ago. And uh, Daniel is going to provide some sort of context for why we have invested in this uh, instance and what its, uh, what its m mission is. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about that and about how, um, how all of you could potentially uh, support and advance its mission. So, Daniel? Thank you, Tony. I'm just going to stay here. Um, yes, sit down. It's casually, been a long casually, day. Casually in the chair yes. in the afternoon. I just wanted to set the scene. Um, I think Michael has really outlined some of the great challenges that we are facing in the industry. And one of the issues is um, we are often not being heard and we are being misperceived in our intentions. And do the traditional policy outreach programs or how we've portrayed ourselves to consumers and policymakers, do they really work or do we need something else? This is what we're here to talk about and um, what hides behind the uh, ECRIM ILC or the industry, industry, industry Leadership Council, a new forum to um, develop a joint initiative and agenda um, to drive this policy dialogue. Just as a reminder, I think there's much more at stake than privacy. We have to understand that we are a really important and weighty industry. Advertising is digital now by default. You see the chart behind me referencing the edX data I mentioned earlier. So we have a large responsibility, not as, as one part of the ad ecosystem, but as an overall representative. In this world, I think we as an industry need to work more together to realize um, um, this potential and obligation. Because we're not just a few companies, we're increasingly moving, and I think this chart really shows it, towards a much more multipolar world of digital advertising, where there are going to be more growth drivers, more companies contributing, more types of business models affecting what policymakers think and hear and act towards digital advertising, and also how consumers are exposed to digital advertising. And we know that digital advertising, we've pushed this forward many times, is a vital ingredient for the overall European economy. Um, studies from Deloitte, McKinsey, with big numbers, have reiterated this time and again, that we're contributing majorly to European GDP, that um, there's a positive correlation between how much you put into advertising and kind of the kind of exponential effect you get out of it. Um, all tried and tested in many different studies but it has fallen on, big, uh, on deaf ears. The law of big numbers really doesn't really apply with policymakers. But providing massive employment in Europe as well. And of course, we are, um, as you also mentioned, Michael, really supporting um, free media and pluralism um, in the overall information ecosystem. And what's often overlooked is, I mean, the technologies that we are developing here within IB Europe, in other industry associations, in uh, garages worldwide, in large corporations, um, both when it comes to privacy and AI, is really, um, a, you know, we are a benchmark industry. We are forerunners in this. We are often the first industry where consumers are exposed to these things. And what we are solving for now can be a bellwether, a template for other industries to act on. But it's not really hard because there's a communication issue going on. Our contributions are not well understood. First of all, if we look at EU policy in particular, if we look at things like the AI Act, DSA, DMA, and so forth, there really is a conflict between the aspiration and action. How often have we seen um, studies being launched by the EU about data spaces, about advancing media, um, positive connotations on personalization? But as soon as that term personalization is being used in an advertising context, it's suddenly about surveillance capitalism. So something is wrong here. We can also see that we as an industry need to do more. There really is a conflict between um, the sincerity of our move to drive towards reform and the everyday of business optimization. These are two things that are often hard to bring, uh, bring in line. Think of the notion of sustainability and, uh, on the one hand and the requirement of scale and you know, QPS costs on the other hand. It's often very difficult to really bring this together. And to tie it all together, I think there is really an impasse 
aspect between policy, consumer, and industry. How really can we move forward? This has huge implications for Europe, as, this, as the chart here illustrates. We're lagging behind in digital development. Um, we're not moving as fast as we should. We're not building out our skills, talent. Uh, we're geopolitically falling behind and also in really fostering uh, digital independence uh, in Europe. And these are some of the challenges where we thought we need a new forum um, within IB Europe, the Industry Leadership Council, or short ILC. It's a group of uh, Europe's, uh, IB Europe's tier one members, and there are really two things that we want to do. We want to reflect on medium and longer term uh, trends, what's impacting us not to be just reactive to certain regulatory texts, but to really think long term, how is our industry going to affect how we live and work together, and provide a new kind of interlocutor, confidence to um, policymakers to ask questions about our industry and to uh, get guidance on AI, metaverse, and other trends. And it's our foremost task to overcome this impasse. And how we're going to do this is three things. We want to jointly align as an industry uh, across the value chain. We want to engage in a new multi-stakeholder dialogue with, clear, with a clear benefit through events, deep dust with policymakers, and so forth. And fundamentally, dust off our policy narrative to really reframe, move towards a more proactive approach, not to defend ourselves as the you know, digital tobacco industry, but rather really move forward and cast ourselves in a, in a light as a creative and future-building industry that is of a benefit to policy and society. And there are many members in the ILC, and we're very glad to have a few of those here on the panel. And with that, I pass back to you, Tony. Thanks very, thanks very much. That's a good, uh, a, a, a good sketch. Um, and it's interesting to, to, to have this session actually after Michael's, uh, Michael's uh, expose also. Um, sometimes I wonder um, whether we make the right analysis of why we have the challenges we have in Brussels and some of the, the national capitals. Um, why we are the unloved child of the digital economy in which Europe is, is uh, purports to be so in, invested. Um, Ries, what, what, what would your uh, assessment be of, of how it can be that at the same time we bring the, the, uh, the contribution that Daniel uh, evoked and yet we persistently uh, seem to fall short on the trust and, 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 and confidence uh, Richter scale in, in Brussels and the, the national capitals. What do you think we're doing well, wrong? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, on, you know, how many seismic shifts we have to bear because I think, uh, you know, data, GDPR has been one that uh, actually, actually brought one thing, actually uh, made one thing clear, at least from a, from a media uh, company like Bertelsmann is with, with RTL Group and our businesses where we touch millions of people every day, uh, of course, we are an industry that is a media industry that is highly regulated and the digital industry has only now started to learn that there is actually some rules of the game that are imposed. So taking that into account, we are actually seeing now um, you know, the reality on how actually digital data and in the next iteration AI will actually make, uh, make things not as easy, it's not as open space anymore as it used to be. We are now sort of into two decades of the internet industry and I think there is some learnings um, and we fall short of as an industry to take a lot of these learnings uh, on board and changing a few things and I think that's why we are sitting here together that's why we actually sort of endeavored on the ILC journey. Hmm. And if I can just jump, jump in there, Reese, I think there, is a, there really is a cognitive dissonance. Right? On the one hand, personalization is being seen as a major vehicle for uh, digital growth. But again, as soon as we put it in the advertising context, it's something, it's something evil. And I think one of the issues that we have is um, we are not just any industry, but we are kind of very close to the consumer. Often um, conclusions, how big data works, it is through our industry that consumers meet and see that for the first time. The pharma industry, the banking industry, all others. They work with far more sensitive data, where there's a certain harm, to clear harm, you know, financial health harm to misconduct. But just to the, of the scale of personalization that we have, we are just the first point of contact. 
And um, as you said, Michael, as soon as something goes wrong, um, it's very hard to rebuild trust. That's why we've been put in this corner of surveillance capitalism. And there are many, I just looked at my phone to see there are, um, there's a strong and also academic community. I think of an academic like Joseph Turo, for instance, who is a, a stark critic of advertising. He wrote books like Niche Envy or The Daily You. Um, analyzing kind of how the ad industry works. And there's one important thing, and this is our own fault, I think. A lot of the research in those books are from Ad Age, Ad Week, other publications. And how often have we not been on at the Mexico and in a sense proclaimed we're one Jira sprint away from reaching singularity? So in a sense, our own industry has really oversold its forensic targeting capabilities and policymakers have taken, have taken note. And we have been too long at this, in this trap of data maximalism and data extractivism. And I think it's time to really fundamentally reform that. I, th I sometimes think it's, it's a good question whether, I mean, in, in, in Brussels, we spend a lot of time convinced um, having, having a dialogue with policymakers that is limited by the inherent technical complexity of the, of the business. And I think it's, it's, you know, sometimes we ask ourselves if they really, can we assume that if they really understood better, uh, there, there would be more trust and confidence? And I think probably the answer is yes. Um, and as you say, maybe some of the marketing uh, uh, rhetoric d distracts from that. Um, so, so maybe to uh, maybe to, to, to Bethan and, 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 and Michael, and um, uh, starting with Bethan, maybe. So, given the the exposure that uh, both Michael and Daniel described, um, is is your sense, and, and you know, which doesn't date from yesterday. Um, is your sense that we are taking our um, societal responsibilities seriously, which probably go beyond the privacy that Michael was focusing on? And, um, and it's, it's a question of communicating better about what we're doing, or, or how much does the substantive work need to be evolved at the same time or first? So I, I think we are taking it seriously but we need to change how we present ourselves, which is what we're touching on here. Mm. So we, um, Michael kindly did my legwork for me and put up all of the initiatives on a slide that we're participating, which are all about the industry yeah. setting the standards to show how we're being responsible. So brand safety standards and setting with TAG is all about how we want to advertise in safe environments and support safe environments, safe for advertisers, safe for the public. And then you have all the uh, efforts that have gone into TCF, so transparency and help be compliant with data usage. Uh, most recently, the call from IAB Europe for a common commitment on sustainability in line with the UN's 17 goals around sustainability. So we've got all of these initiatives that we're doing and then that's just the joined up ones. WFA representing advertisers is pushing in their media charters for mm. specific actions around responsibility in society, sustainability and the planet. And they're out in advertiser actions and industry asks. So again, we see it there. Group M, we're trying to put forward our responsible investment network. So we buy media in a way that's sustainable, ethical, um, and, it may, and we're doing it in a representative way, which makes sure we also meet client goals, right? They've got different still commercial goals. Mm. So we're all trying, and Google has many initiatives, as Michael touched on as well. So I think the challenge is we're there. We're ready to put the guardrails in. Most people are ready to follow them and do follow them, but we don't present it in the right way, and we don't emphasize the positive impact we're having through all of this activity on society. And so we need to change that. And one thought that came to mind is we take clients behind the scene. I don't think I've ever taken a policymaker behind the scene at work. Would that help them? Would that break the barrier about being the, you know, the naughty digital industry? No. Yeah. I mean, I think you've, you've hit a lot of really good points there, Bethan. And I, so I, I, my, my, my perspective is that, I, you know, are, are we taking our responsibility seriously enough? I mean, probably the answer is, well, no, we can always do more. Um, I think there's a will. The will is there in a way that pro we probably don't get credit for. And to your point, there's just so many initiatives. And, and I think that's sometimes part of our problem. I think the other thing is that, you know, we, we are a 
as I'm kind of going back to my Eurovision analogy, like we are a collection of different businesses and different business models and different yeah. industries that fall under this umbrella. And, and we're not very good at speaking with one voice about what we are doing. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's a problem. It's, you know, if it, we might be doing some amazing work, but, but policymakers are hearing different messages from different parts of the industry. It's easy to fall into our own little groups of, of, of companies that, that, that are like us. Um, and I think what we need to be better at doing is sort of taking that step back uh, of seeing the bigger picture and seeing what we have in common and what we, what we agree on and then going to speak confidently with, to politicians about the work that we're collectively doing because there's, there's loads of good stuff going on. And you know, if you sit around not just the IAB table but, but at other tables in the industry, most of the conversations are about standards. It's about how can we improve, what can we do better, how can we respond to this concern from the public or politicians or brands or uh, like it dominates the conversation. Um, in a way that's quite exhausting, but, but it's, it's obviously vital and, and, and I think we don't get the credit we deserve because we're not very good at communicating that. Which is an important part of the ILC's mission, I guess, to bring this cross-ecosystem uh, uh, formation um, to, to engage and on a, a set of issues that are complementary to and, and different from the sort of meat and potatoes lobbying that, um, that, we, that seems to absorb so, so much of our, of our time. Um, how about you, any, anything to add, Riz, on, on, on that, uh, on, well, on whether we're do, do it, doing enough? And and uh, and how much of how much of it is 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 communication and helping and over overcoming the the challenge to communication that arises from the complexity of the industry. I think it's it's, it's fairly fairly simple in terms of uh, uh, just looking at the journey that we had in the ILC itself. Is basically the first couple of meetings was actually about you know what are we talking about because we're all masters of communicating and marketing our own solutions and products, but actually in bringing it together into getting all ducks in a row and actually trying to sort of compare and actually share the insights on how does the business work in practice? What is targeting? Data is not data. AI is not AI. So actually, making uh, uh, making a storyline actually work to to uh, to give an understanding. And for sure, we don't agree with Google all along every day. Um, but we also uh, think that the, uh, the the advertising is there for greater good. Uh, it funds media. It funds culture, and it funds a lot of the consumer spend out there. And the advertisers um, across uh, the uh, the value chain are fueling this through the value chain, but we've not really set a line of narrative that explains this in a transparent way. De facto, we've been shying away from this discussion in the last couple of years. How, how about, so, so data, data is obviously, you know, a core part of, a core opportunity, as, as, as Daniel explained, core part of the challenge, again, getting back to the complexity. Um, but talking about data and addressing data head on is probably only a part of a, part of the strategy. Um, maybe um, let's, you know, start with Beth and again. Um, to what degree do you think data ca can be? You know, can it be most of the conversation right now because of the particular concern about AI and privacy and 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 and, and what's the right balance between data and the other? Because we are implicated in all these other facets of, you know, from democracy to you know. Well, I think we've touched on it. It has to be an overarching and common message from the industry. So it can't be focused on just one piece of the puzzle. And um, it was shocking to realize, most people might have realized it, or maybe not, depending on where you, you work, but GDPR is five years old. Yeah. Five years of data conversations. And we have moved. The industry is not using data in the same way as it was pre-GDPR GDPR, when there were legislators looking at controlling what we do with data. And now we're in the AI world fully. Um, AI, 
used for modeling, decision making has been around for a long time. We've used it in our product at Saxus called Copilot since 2018. Again, it's not new. And then now we have generative AI, which everyone is asking, how do we use that to become more efficient as an industry? Um, and I think a recent survey I saw is 10% of those Fortune 500 companies are using AI, generative AI tools already. I bet we're higher than that 10% in our industry. Yeah. So we're already using it. We're already in that position. We were in pre-GDPR, and now we've got AI regulation coming from the EU. We've got the UK looking at consulting around whether they want a separate AI legislation or they want to factor it into other laws. And, and so AI is already there. So now we've got a chance already to get on the front foot because we're already using it. So let's start talking about it and being, we hold ourselves to high standards, ethical standards around using it, transparency standards around using it. We also see challenges. We're not sure about how you maintain confidentiality if you put your information into generative AI. We're not sure if all the rights holders have given permission for you to use that and generate something else from that information. So we can talk about that. Why aren't we, you know, setting forward our industry message already and that's before we get into sustainability and diversity and everything else we should have a joined up voice on. So data's a tiny part and maybe we can learn by looking back about how we weren't good at communicating around use of data and what's our opportunity here. Yeah. I was, I was interested to see, Michael, on the statistics about, you know, um, users, you know, this many users don't remember the numbers, um, you know, feeling they don't have control, this many users feeling more positive once they feel they have control. Um, there's a huge amount of control provided by GDPR, which, like, somehow either isn't being provided or people don't appreciate it, don't understand it. And it is, it is so frustrating to think that companies have invested so much in compliance and um, we could still be having a conversation that's almost like in a vacuum as if all that, you know, a very prescriptive rule didn't exist, it didn't exist. But um, yeah, from a Google, Google point of view, you were focused mainly on, mainly on privacy, but sort of beyond, beyond data, as we, as we think of approaching the, 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 you know, senior strategic policy leadership in the EU and talking about something other than the immediate challenge of implementing DSA or, you know, the final amendments on the Data Act or something, um, what are the, yeah, from your perspective, what are, the, what are, are there, are there topics beyond data that we would want to add to the, to the ILC? see um, repertoire and, and, and sort of impression we make and, and dialogue we engage uh, with the, this senior leadership inside the EU institutions on? We, I mean, there are, I mean, the, uh, sustainability is huge. You've already met, yeah. mentioned, mentioned, mentioned yeah. that, Beth, and, and sustainability as a debate is, is just as an issue for us as an industry is just going to get bigger. AI, of course, for us, it's huge. And, and, and actually on AI, there's a, I don't want to get into an AI debate, but you know, one of the things we, we use AI to help solve these challenges as well. This isn't, you know, AI is obviously we need to think about the responsibility in the ethics around AI, and that's a huge societal debate, not just one for the ad industry. But, you know, we, we uh, removed 5.2 billion ads from our systems for breaching our policies last year, and millions of videos on YouTube for breaching our community guidelines before anyone had seen them. And the only way we can do that is because we use machine learning to help police our systems. There are opportunities for us to solve some of these other challenges yeah. with AI, and I think that's something that we can, we should think about. And I think beyond going back to the ad stuff and talking to the EU policymakers, it's a lot of traditional issues. It's, it's children, it's responsibility, it's controversial advertising for controversial subjects like alcohol and gambling and those kind of issues. And obviously content policy is a huge thing that obviously affects the advertising debate more broadly, especially across our platforms. So those, but I, I don't, I, I, sometimes I think we, we can get lost in our own digital world and some of the more traditional ad industry issues we think are not ours and they are ours and I kind of made the big plug for the national ad regulators in my presentation, the auto controls of the world. They're like, just because they're 50 years old, it doesn't mean they're not vital. They're absolutely, it, they are the, the main point of contact for users in our markets who want to complain about ads and governments know them like, and they are looking to evolve and become more digital specific. These these more traditional institutions and more traditional policy issues are still ours and, and we can't ignore them. We can't think, oh, that's just the TV debate about, you know, alcohol advertising and watersheds. 
So we've still got to we've still got to deal with those as well. I think increasingly so. Um, we've, we've got about a, a, I guess a little over a year of experience of, of the ILC um, un, under our belts. It's um, been I think it's fair to say it's been a a, a deliberate and methodical and careful uh, 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 start. Um, maybe just go across the row and say, ask each of you um, to what extent you feel the ILC can, can, can lead, can be a sort of Pied Piper um, uh, to, um, uh, well, I think the Pied Piper drew things away rather than d drawing things in, um, but um, uh, uh, that can, uh, to which there can be a sort of accretion of interest and enthusiasm to, to help change the conversation and enlarge the conversation and um, uh, open the eyes of our EU and, and uh, national policymaker audience to the, the, the richness and opportunity of the industry uh, rather than this sort of more frightened and, and, and defensive attitude. What's your, what's your prediction or prognosis right now? Well, I think uh, on the uh, on the Pied Piper, I think that you know, uh, at least we should sort of have you know the IAB as a trailblazer to actually be able to close the ranks and follow certain principles of ethics and take responsibility, take out bad practices um, that we have in our across the value chain, um, and um, also making potentially some you know convictions on how we don't want to run our business and. and and also start engaging actually and communicating on this. Uh, Betham, you just mentioned it. You have these principles also starting to introduce them. I think also as publishers we can we can do our piece, and, but we're not able to do it solid as a sort of uh, in, in solitary confinement on each uh, vertical of our value chain uh, mm -hmm. segment. But we need to do this together. Otherwise, this will not work. Um, and here I see you know various tools that we could actually put in place and where we can actually also then make sure that you know it's not always just take the money and run but it's actually also saying no at some points and I think that's a that's an important step uh, it's not an easy one uh, but I think that's where we need to sort of you know get a grip on it and I think there we can then get more credibility and actually show that certain practices in the past are not in there and that's part of the communication and the explanation we have potentially also to policymakers together because I think if we have companies like ours and you saw the logo wall you know, coming and approaching uh, policymakers, I think that makes a difference and makes an impact. Daniel, as our, as a, with an outside perspective, as IAB Europe's chief economist, how, how, would you, how would you look in at us and assess the opportunity that the ILC provides as a, as a complement to our, our, our meat and potatoes policy advocacy? I think Rhys made a very important point that the IRC can only succeed if we um, embrace reform in our industry ourselves. We have to practice. We have to practice what we preach, and we need to show policymakers evidence that um, we are taking the things we talk about seriously. And maybe not just do the bare minimum, but move already to the next step to go where the next regulatory frontier is likely going to be. This is something which the ILC internally can do through knowledge sharing across the companies. And the other side of the coin really is to um, the ILC as a forum, um, to me means um, to move beyond this kind of rear view mirror topics of ad hoc defense in ongoing policy discussions and to take the liberty to talk openly amongst amongst all of us what the next areas are where we want to interact with policymakers in civil society and use the experience that we're gaining often as an innovator and early adopter industry and share that with policymakers proactively um, in untainted environments you know we mentioned um, AI for instance we are early adopters and early practitioners a lot of the questions questions around ethics, about regulation, what are sensible use cases, where are certain friction points. Um, they can be discussed academically, but they also often emerge from practice. And if we take ourselves uh, and say we have made these and these learnings to policymakers, it changes the narrative. We are suddenly suppliers of information and um, these trusted interlocutors that we want the IL uh, ILC to be rather than defendants sitting on a hot chair. 
especially as the, the environment in which these policymakers are trying to uh, make the agenda, say, for the next commission, just becomes increasingly complex. And as they are, as, as remote as, as of necessity they are from the, the business and, and technology realities. Anything you would add, Bethan, to, to what well, Daniel and Hansi said? Building on what Michael said and Risa said, when we go as individual IABs or individual companies to talk and represent a point of view, or even a sector within our industry and represent our point of view, we're also creating problems for ourselves because the policymakers look at us and say, well, we don't believe you are telling us the true story because we've talked to this part of the industry and they said something slightly different. Yeah. So we feel the industry is maybe hiding something or you're not working together as you claim to set standards that everyone will follow. So we're actually harming ourselves by not figuring out what is this joined up one voice that we can go to and where can we step beyond the current you know, issues and conversations that policy make and take to, to them the next challenge that's coming and say, we've already thought about it. We're already working on it. Let us show you what we're doing on this space. Let's show us, let us show you we are societally responsible in our yeah, I think that's a really major, really major point in Brussels right now anyway. Anything to add, um, Michael? I mean, just uh, the, I, I, I'm not sure whether the ILC is going to be the Pied Piper. <laughs> I, I think IAB has to be the Pied Piper. I think perhaps we can help make the music that comes out of the pipe. <laughs> yeah. I'm going down a rabbit hole here. Yeah, um, a rat but, hole. Yeah, rat hole. Um, but, um, uh, but I think, you know, uh, what, to, to Bethan's point, we, ha we have, what we want to try and do is craft that single narrative and then, uh, and then help enable IAB to take a more bold position because with the confidence that it, it, it's a position that represents the interests of all its members. And it's a huge, I mean, I don't envy you, Tony. You do an amazing job. We, we are an incredibly difficult group and and, and, and actually, what, if the ILC can do anything, if we can help you and your team and, and the IB Europe board feel confident with a narrative that you can take out to policymakers and opinion formers, then I think that, that, that will, will do our job well. Um, Daniel mentioned civil society. Any, anyone want to venture any observation on engagement with civil society? So I have to say, um, this, is a, this is a debate we've gone back and forth on um, in the time I've been at IAB Europe, we've sort of had a um, uh, limited, rather carefully circumscribed um, interactions with civil society, always with the aspiration that it should be broader and deeper, um, meeting up with the same uh, issue of complexity, and then an almost um, like a systemic kind of um, uh, resistance uh, that is part of the protection of the integrity of their um, role and, and positioning. Any, any thoughts on ILC or IAB Europe engagement with civil society? Anyone want to pick that one up? Well, if, if I just take it from a, let's say, a media or publisher's kind of perspective, um, of course, you know, um, we influence through news and journalism uh, a lot of the society uh, in there, and we need to sort of also counter uh, uh, mis and disinformation uh, every day. Um, and that's kind of, a, um, a, a, you know, the value in our democracy that, that we need to keep up high. Um, but uh, it, is, um, uh, it is all funded via advertising. And uh, at least from our commercial, uh, let's say, approach, next to the uh, uh, pubcasters, and it's, it's imp important that uh, this is just realized also uh, by uh, the policy and, and, and regulators, because we need to work on a uh, on a level of uh, of digital innovation to keep these uh, products actually um, also relevant to our consumers and viewers, uh, and that works with data, and that works with all the technologies that we've been just discussing but it is not perceived as that driver in society. And I think that's where the conversation needs to change. And uh, that's where we've been working on a narrative, but on the other side also want to sort of go into an event series or something like that in the second half year to actually make this more tangible and also my work in practice. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, actually, um, can, it, um, can any of you share some uh, specific aspects of the ILC's plans, say, for the remainder of this year? 
Daniel. I'm happy to start. Um, so we're starting with um, with a new paper, which I'm which I'm just uh, just finalising, which is kind of the, the the backbone for a lot of activities. It's a it's it's a broader paper about the contribution that, that that advertising makes that codifies a lot of the points that we are making here on the panel, in particular about future looking points. So not rehashing contributions to GDP and other points which have fallen on deaf ears. Not to uh, stress the SME point, which has been made a lot of times, but rather really um, look at these future-looking contributions that we as an industry can do. And we want to see this paper as a, launch, as a launch pad to have um, um, infographics, interventions, but also specific dedicated event series and deep dives to inform policymakers and, and civil society. And I think here is a, is a very important point about how to engage with civil society, Tony, to your previous question. I think there is a common misconception when you're in the industry association framework that you reach out to civil society as an organized form, right? As a interlocutor who is also a civil society association. Um, but by virtue of their self-existence, uh, often dialogue and uh, it says mu mu mutual recognition uh, um, is, not, is not desired. And so I think what we as an ILC need to do with one of our, our outputs is um, to, to work with the wider industry, um, how we can indirectly, through our everyday actions, through user experiences, through other things, engage and shape the opinions of civil society. Probably not going to come back to this era of advertising as this positive agent of culture, like in the 60s, in the Mad Men age, there is a reason why um, uh, you know, um, that period was cast um, as something relatable in advertising and not, uh, and not today's era. But this is something we as the ILC have to, have to try through our outputs to, uh, to correct. Um, if we, uh, if, if, so we, we've uh, explained the ILC as, as, a, as, a, as a leadership group um, in, inside IAB Europe, but the intention is certainly not that it should be an exclusive uh, instance, but rather that it should be a, a, a motor and, and a, a, a place where we, we, we do uh, thinking and planning and engagement that is you know, complementary to the other uh, policy and indeed uh, non-policy non work um, can we uh, can we think of, of ways that our our beloved audience who are getting to the end of a long day now um, can engage and, and support the work of the uh, of, of the ILC anyone have concrete ideas about uh, maybe carrying the message maybe, maybe it'd be interesting to, to sort of test the audience about how, how the how this idea of a of a kind of um, a, 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 a side side a, a not not parallel or side but a, a complementary channel to the the strategic uh, sort of people looking to make the you know policy decisions for the next four or five years in your governments and the EU institutions not to disguise or hide or, or, or but change the conversation in a positive way. Does this sound like a plausible and useful investment of, of our time and resources and of the important figures that are up on the stage with me and something that um, people would be interested in, in reproducing in their, own, uh, in their own markets? Does it feel like something that, that IAB Europe should be doing in addition to the more defensive policy work that... Uh, that we we have we communicate on every week. Any sense of that from the audience, or or comparable work that anyone's an organization that anyone a national IEB that you you belong to is doing. I think you're touching very much on the ask there that we would have a concrete ask is to everyone who's a member of national IEBs or a member of IEB Europe if you have or you're working on studies, uh, policy documents, research, uh, thought papers in this space, we'd love to hear from you. This is not something, again, it's, an it's got to be an industry position that's put forward. So if people are already thinking in this way, we need to bring it together. So if, you know, don't, don't hold back, <laughs> come help us. 
Yeah, I think uh, you were saying uh, exactly the point that we actually want to have examples out of the, from practitioners. We want to have experts that actually can explain and translate very complex issues. And I think uh, it's not actually to do some kind of uh, uh, dog and pony trust washing exercise of yeah. any of the products, yeah. uh, but actually making uh, making e explanations and sort of creating transparency is very much uh, agnostic from which side of the camp you come, but we want to have a full spectrum to, so to have not these contradictions anymore, but at least have a baseline of explanations, even though each and every uh, business will have differences, and I think we can make that clear if we have that joint approach. So whoever wants to come forward with some ideas and examples on this is really invited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a key point to, to kind of take the wisdom of our industry because um, people who are lobbying against advertising are incredibly well organized. There is a consistent narrative and there is a very um, appealing narrative about um, you know, disinformation, surveillance and so forth, which is you know, very easy for policymakers, for critics to be receptive to. And of course, we have our own methods at hand through experiences we have in our own companies, through economic analysis and other things to create evidence that our industry is different. But we need more of that evidence. Um, is there a way where advertising really saved a small and medium-sized business? Is there a particular compelling experience how we have used AI? Is there something where we can show um, through a case study or a demo where um, advertising was really leap leaning into this creative explosion that we're see seeing in AI? What cool new products are we designing which are tangible and visible that people can positively relate to? All those different things if you have any of those at hand, if you read something, if you do something, it will be incredibly valuable input for us. Um, well, that's good. That's a great update on what I think is a really important opportunity and um, instrument for us in the, the trust and transparency uh, challenge and opportunity. So thank you, for, uh, thank you for the insight. And I would hand back to our fearless leader, Joanna.